Principal McRae and honored guests, I'm very happy to be here. I didn't realize I followed in such a noble succession. If you told me all that, I would have thought second or given other thoughts to this. I feel something like Bennett Cerf's old venerable rabbi, the story he tells, as the rabbi went from place to place in Siberia giving lectures. After about 80 such visits to synagogues, his old driver said to him, Rabbi, this has been such an exciting time. I've heard your lecture 80 times now. Would it be possible at the next synagogue if we would change clothes? And I give the lecture, and you have the evening off. And the learned rabbi, feeling rather jovial, said, Well, all right, but... Remember, clothes don't make the man. And the, rab the driver said, don't worry, Rabbi. I think I have it down pat. So he gave the lecture that night, and all went very well, except at the end what they didn't expect, a question period. <laughs> and from the back, one ancient gentleman posed a very difficult question of Talmudic law. And the bogus rabbi stood there with his arms crossed and looked at the gentleman. And when he had given the statement, the bogus rabbi said, My good man, that's such an evidently elemental question that even my old driver can answer that. Driver, come up here and answer that for him. <laughs> there might very well be the time when we're going to have to get show our true hand and ask some driver to come up here to answer the question, and then you'll see where we really stand, I'm afraid. I'm very privileged to be here these four evenings and to be with you during the day as well. And I have taken a rather provocative title, Life in the Face of Death, the Resurrection Message of 1 Corinthians 15. And I would like to talk tonight something about death, and then something about the importance of Paul's message in dealing with that question and with life after death from the resurrection perspective, and then allow the next three times together to get into something of the exegesis of the passage. Death, of course, is the mocking specter that haunts all of our lives, the universal foreboding the dark sense within our human consciousness of impending evil, the great enigma of life. Why, with all of life's potential, and with all of life's promise, with all of life's preparation, with all of life's accomplishments, must it all end in death? I remember hearing two years ago in 80, well, more than that, 86, a CBC radio interview I won't divulge the name of the Canadian poet, but at that time he was 76. And the interviewer asked him, now that you are older, what do you strive for? Expecting to have something very interesting laid out as to the poet's agenda. And the poet answered, I strive for immortality, to be remembered, not oblivion. If I cannot myself be immortal, I want at least to be remembered. I am angry at oblivion. And I couldn't help but shudder and yet nod and say certainly the response of humanity. Why is it that the only thing in our physical life that's certain is death? Death is the great tragedy, the great imponderable of human existence. With all of our cleverness, we are powerless before death. We may postpone it, assuage its physical pains, comfort its emotional trauma, rationalize it, deny its existence, but we cannot escape it, of course. I hate to be the harbinger of sad tale, but that's the tale of our life. It's very much my personal story and very much your personal story. Admittedly, the consciousness of death is not always to the fore in our thinking. In our youth, perhaps, little attention is given to death. Young people aren't generally too concerned about death. 
true with the nuclear threat of racial genocide, we've all been drawn up rather sharply to realize the awful death potential all about us, and young people of late have faced the grim possibilities of racial genocide, but then with the re rather recent easing of Cold War tensions between the superpowers, most young people today seem to have relaxed about such an eventuality. Unless there's been death in our personal family, encountered death in some way personally in our families, Young people's interests are usually focused on something more of survival or employment or vocation. They're not talking, is there life after death? But they're talking, is there life after graduation? <laughs> or even, is there life after birth? <laughs> Youth is a time for dreaming dreams, as well as a time for one thinking that he or she is indestructible. I can remember my youth. You might not believe that. Intellectually optimistic, hopeful, with a sense of adventure. Physically feeling that I was almost indestructible. And trying to keep that feeling during my 20s and 30s by a regime of exercise. Trying to remember that feeling in the 40s and thinking back to it in the 50s and wondering how I'm going to get along in the 60s and 70s. But youth is a time for dreaming dreams, not thinking about death. And in our adult concentration on living, often little attention is given to death. The Chinese philosopher Confucius thought entirely about the present, social, ethical, political concerns of this life. And when one of his followers asked Confucius about death, he replied, if we do not yet know about life, how can we know about death? Many attempts are made to make life meaningful. So in Latin American liberation theology, of course, the question has to do with authentic human living experienced here and now. So in uh, Bonino's Room to be People of 79, he has chapter titles that follow something like this. Is there life before death? Do human beings exist? For all caught up with the issues of life here and now, and in such a theology, not always faced with the questions of death. It is legitimate to talk in terms of life here and now. Much better Confucian or liberation theology than much of our modern materialism where the dominant philosophy of the day is oriented almost entirely towards making a living and success being measured by the abundance of what we possess and in such a materialism references to death are viewed as being somewhat morbid or discussions of death as somewhat evidences of a sick mind. Yet despite our natural aversion to thinking about death Death is the ever-present fact of life, and only as we come to terms with death, its reality, its implications, and what the Christian gospel has to say in regard to death, will we be able to live, to understand life, and to live it to the full. And so, our presentations of this week, death as the backdrop for the discussions, but I would like to make the focus of our discussions on life in the face of death. Now what I would like to do tonight is first of all start out with some diverse views of death drawn from mankind's philosophical and religious past because I want to also show how the gospel fits into all of that and contrast at times with that. Every philosophy, every religion deals in some way with the problem of death with most offering some understanding of life after death. In the East, Hinduism, Buddhism, Confucianism, others, but at least those, present somewhat separate ways of understanding the human situation. And in the West, we have the classical Greek tradition, the Judeo-Christian tradition, and humanism, which have competed with one another and at times have seemingly become amalgamated and since today we live in something of the overlapping of all of these, 
I would like to speak about these very briefly in order then to go on to uh, the New Testament and to 1 Corinthians 15. Let me just spell them out somewhat. First, in Hinduism, the Vedas, Sanskrit for, Sanskrit for knowledge, the oldest writings of Hinduism, little attention is given to death as such. The authors of these four collections of psalms, incantations, hymns, formulas of worship are most interested in life and speak only rather vaguely of death and the afterlife. They talk in terms of the soul, but with no great development, and fear most what they refer to as re-death, or the second death, that is, as Krishna called it, the terrible wheel of death and rebirth. The Upanishads, Sanskrit for sitting near to or secret wisdom, however, take somewhat of a different stance for these writings, from the 7th century and on, view life much more negatively than the writers of the Vedas. So they give prominence to the eternal soul, that is, the inmost being of each person, and the inmost being of all that exists, which has no personal characteristics, and so is both birthless and deathless. And it is Hinduism, as interpreted by the Upanishads, that is most practiced in India today and is best known worldwide. For Hinduism generally, human death has no reality. For the eternal soul can neither come to an end or have a beginning. What appears to be born and subsequently to die is not real, but of the nature of illusion. This illusory self is a creation of and totally subject to the contingent world. It is because people have misunderstood their true natures and the world about them that they believe in birth and death. But they can deliver themselves from this ignorance by the acquisition of true knowledge, which comes about through spiritual discipline. So Hinduism generally views the endless cycle of reincarnation, which seemingly goes on and on until the full acquisition of knowledge comes about, as more terrible than physical death since the latter is only the death of one's illusory self. Buddhism and Hinduism in their purer forms have much in common. In fact, Buddhism is generally viewed as a non-orthodox form of Hinduism, since both lay stress on the path of true enlightenment for the overcoming of death. Yet the Buddha rejected the Vedas in talking about suffering and death as illusory, and rather talks about and acknowledges both death and suffering as real. Human existence for Buddhism is under the power of both suffering and death. There is, in fact, according to Buddhistic, Buddhistic teaching, no aspect of one's personal being that can escape the natural forces of causation in the world or can escape oblivion. Yet as humans, we try to be permanent entities in an impermanent world. So in resisting impermanence and change, we suffer, and in denying death, we delude ourselves. For classical Buddhism, then, death is an unavoidable fact of real existence that must be accepted. It causes anguish only when one attempts to elude it, either by explaining it away or attempting to retreat into the confines of some eternal soul that cannot be touched by it. Rather, the supreme spiritual achievement of Buddhists is, by contemplation, coming to a state of non-self. In fact, one of the methods practiced by Buddhist monks for overcoming their desires of permanence or changelessness is to contemplate a corpse in varying stages of decay. For by this method, one discovers that death is nothing, and so concomitantly, that life also is nothing, which then brings one to a state of non-self, and thus to be apart from suffering. Confucianism, the Chinese philosopher Confucius, was generally unconcerned with regard to death and agnostic regarding life after death. His was a social, ethical, political system of teaching that focused only on life, 
and rather resignedly accepted the fact of death, so he devoted much less attention to death than is the case with either Hinduism or Buddhism. As the later Confucius scholar Yang Xing, who lived a generation or two before Christ, said, where there is life, there must be death, and where there is beginning, there must be an end. Such is the natural course, and thus resignedly accepting it. Confucius thought down through the centuries, however, has intermingled with all sorts of things, Taoism, Buddhism, and a variety of popular concession, conceptions of death and the afterlife, so that in popular Confucianism, many believe the continued existence of the soul, and that at death, Human substance returns to the natural process from which it comes, there to re-enter the cosmic cycles of production and dissolution, which is the Chinese version of reincarnation. So the prevalent attitude towards death in Confucianism is that of acceptance and, and resignation, paralleling modern humanism oft times, with a bit of reincarnation thrown in. In the Western world, Probably the most prevailing view of death had its origin in the philosophical teachings of Plato. In the Orphic cult, which claimed to stem from the legendary Thracian poet and musician Orpheus, the celebrated pun was Soma Sima. Soma, the body, Sima is a tomb. Out of this ideological background, Plato developed his doctrine of the immortality of the soul and his view towards physical death. In his earlier apology, Plato is rather reserved and ambiguous regarding death. Quote, for the state of death is one of two things. Either the dead man wholly ceases to be and loses all consciousness, or, as we are told, it is a change and a migration of the soul to another place. Note that little statement, or, as we are told, which suggests drawing on some other tradition or previous suggestion, perhaps from the East. In the later Phaedo, however, which purports to be a conversation between Socrates and his friends on the day of Socrates' execution, Plato is more definite, quote, when death attacks a man, his mortal part dies, but his immortal part retreats before death and goes away safe and indestructible. In the Phaedo, Plato says that Socrates' reasons for believing the soul to be immortal were based chiefly on his understanding of the nature of knowledge. One, that knowledge is composed of ideas, and ideas can neither come from things nor consist in things. And two, that ideas are changeless and eternal, without themselves coming into existence or passing away. And three, since ideas reside in the soul and not in anything material, it must follow that the soul is also changeless and eternal. Yet Plato concludes the Phaedo by having Socrates relate what he calls a tale to his friends regarding the destiny of the soul after its release from the body, which tale then concludes with these words, quote, A man of sense will not insist that these th things are exactly as I have described them, but I think he will believe that something of the kind is true of the soul and her habitations, seeing that she is shown to be immortal and that it is worth his while to stake everything on this belief." Unquote. Thus, in Greek thought, there is an anthropological dualism. Soma, Sima, the body is corporeal and mortal, with physical death inevitable. But the soul is non-corporeal and immortal, with what makes up the soul comprising the true essence of a person. The relation of the soul to the body is comparable to that of a kernel of grain in its husk. Or, as J.A.T. Robinson once said, more crudely put, something like that of an angel held prisoner in a slot machine. The body imprisons the soul during the life, with the result that as long as the soul remains imprisoned in the body, true wisdom cannot be fully acquired. At death, however, the soul is finally released from its imprisonment. So while, the phys while physical death was never taken lightly by the Greeks, the escape of the soul at death was welcomed and accepted as release from material confinement. The Judeo 
Christian tradition, however, views matters differently. In the Old Testament, the scriptures of both Jews and early Christians, there is a decided emphasis on the inseparability of body and soul. A person, according to the Old Testament, is not someone who just has a body, but he or she is a body, nor someone who just possesses a soul, but he or she is a soul. And so these words can be used somewhat interchangeably and synonymously at times. Thus, in the Old Testament scriptures, a per person is not, as for Plato, a separable soul that takes flight at the moment or just before the body expires. But a person is a totality of both material and immaterial features that function together in life and are affected together in death. It is on this idea of the wholeness of the human personality that the Judeo-Christian tradition regarding death and the future builds. People are not souls stuffed into bodies or bodies animated by souls. Rather, people are created by God with both immaterial and material features, and it is the divine intent that such psychosomatic features combine to make up the wholeness of the person, both in life and in death. In the Old Testament, death is looked on as a fearsome and tyrannical foe, as also in the New Testament, where Paul calls it, in 1 Corinthians 15, 26, the last enemy. Yet death is also viewed as ordained by God, with God looking favorably and tenderly on the death of his faithful ones. You remember Psalm 116, 15, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And furthermore, with God somehow keeping those faithful ones in intimate fellowship with himself. Compare, for example, the sense expressed in many of the Psalms that the faithful who live in intimate relationship with God will not lose that intimacy even in death. Or compare, for instance, Jesus' argument on the resurrection contra the Sadducees in Mark 12, 26 and 27 and parallels where Jesus says, Ah, but God spoke these words to Moses. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And then said, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. He played atomistically on the present tense, I am. But underlying that was the consciousness that when God establishes covenant relationship with his people, even death does not end that. So in our Judeo-Christian tradition, death is looked on as a fearsome foe, the last enemy, which brings real grief and awful sorrow. Yet there is hope, for God in his graciousness and love continues his relationship with his own even after death, which relationship I would like to suggest in the forthcoming lectures is progressively spelled out throughout the Old Testament and the New, and for the Christian culminated in that great act of proclamation of 1 Corinthians 15. I want to hold a full, further treatment of Judeo-Christian heritage for what follows in this lecture and the other lectures uh, for spelling out there the distinctive features of the Christian hope as set forth in 1 Corinthians 15. For now, allow me just to refer to one other view of death that has been advanced in the West before then turning in greater detail to the Judeo-Christian understanding. And I refer sixthly in my list here to what I've identified as Renaissance humanism. The Renaissance of roughly the 14th through the 16th centuries reached behind the so-called Dark Ages of the 5th through the 15th when theological perspectives on man and the world became solidified and sadly incrustated, to recapture much of what had been deemed to be worthy from the classical Greek philosophers. In the Renaissance, the focus was on man, often man apart from God. So in naturalistic humanism that developed, death was viewed as perfectly natural, a perfectly natural feature of human existence, a feature to be accepted as a natural occurrence, and thus only one further datum in the understanding of human existence, at least understood that way for mankind generally, though oft times 
not understood for our own death personally. Some Renaissance thinkers still wanted to hold on to a person's inherent immortality as resident in the soul, in line with Greek thoughts about immortality. So were content to view physical death as perfectly natural, but also believed that in some way the personhood of the individual was not affected since the essence of the person resided in his or her detachable soul. Many Renaissance thinkers, however, saw death as the end of an individual's personhood and thought of immortality only in terms of the immortality of the race. With an individual's immortality to be seen only in his or her posterity. In death, a person loses his or her personhood, uniqueness, and irreplaceability. So death must be accepted as perfectly natural and received calmly as inevitable. Though again, the death of all people generally, though perhaps not of ourselves in particular. All one could hope for in the naturalistic humanism of most Renaissance thinkers was the immortality of the race and the continuance of one's ideals in one's posterity, but certainly not the continuance of one's person in some form after death. Since today we live amidst the overlapping of all of these, and I've listed some six uh, traditions and approaches, it's not surprising to find all of these answers competing for allegiance in our own thinking regarding death and its significance. One, it is illusory, simply non-existent, which is an inheritance drawn from Eastern religious philosophy, in particular Hinduism, but is carried on in many ways in the Western world, chiefly in the so-called Christian science group. So with such a view, our reactions are those of denial, dispelling of ignorance, training the mind to renounce ideas about the reality of the physical, and hope oftentimes for the reincarnation of the soul. Or we can say of death it is perfectly natural and to be accepted with tranquility, which is our inheritance from Buddhism or Confucianism or naturalistic humanism. And so we have reactions of resignation, training the mind not to think of death in personal terms, making the most out of this life even with a consciousness of personal oblivion, hoping for the continuation of our, de our ideals in our posterity and the ongoing life of mankind generally. Or we can say of death, it is the liberation of the soul, the setting free of the real person from the husks of material existence, our inheritance from Greek philosophy. So reactions of sorrowful resignation, yet oftentimes welcoming death as a liberator, with then additional ideas of a soulish world apart from the physical world, and or possibly even reincarnation of souls into new bodies. Or we can look forthly at death as a fearsome and tyrannical foe, yet ordained by God, so with the person in some manner being upheld by God and kept in continued intimacy with God, which I would suggest is our inheritance from our Judeo-Christian tradition. And so we have reactions of grief, of sadness, even anger over the termination of life. <coughs> Yet, hope that recognizes ultimate victory over death and life lived eternally in God's presence. Reginald Bibby, you know, in Fragmented Gods, reports that Canadians are almost equally divided between five dominant reactions to death. One, that of mystery. Two, that of sorrow. Three, that of fear. Four, that of hope. And five, that of a feeling of nothing in particular. He tells us that the predominant Anglican United Church response is that of mystery. And I would like to later when we pass out a bibliography tomorrow, uh, we didn't get it done today, uh, have show some bibliography there that talks in terms of death as mystery from some of these groups. Or that of the response of Protestant conservatives and Roman Catholic charismatics is mostly that of hope, with those professing no religious affiliation, as well as many in the churches, 
saying that they have no particular feelings whatsoever, remaining agnostic and in somewhat of stunned silence in the face of death. And regarding life after death, as Bibby reports, 30% of Canadians either are uncertain about a future life, 16%, or denied entirely, 14%, with 70% believing there must be something after death, Yet of those 70% who believe there must be something after death, one-tenth think of that something in terms of reincarnation. And one-half of those 70% have no idea whatever what it might be. Indeed, as Bibby points out, with regard to our understanding of death and life after death, Canadians as a whole have been little influenced by the Christian message. Secondly, I would like to go now to the point of death and the resurrection of Christ as the focus of Christian proclamation and move slowly into 1 Corinthians 15. Other religions and philosophies focus on the teachings of their founder or leading thinkers and can be called, quote, path religions, unquote, following those teachings. That is, they focus on teachings in order to gain enlightenment or achieve non-personality or escape from fate or gain release from the unending cycle of time or gain release from the never-ending cycle of death and rebirth or simply to be in some way accepted by the deity. And we've mentioned a number of these, Hinduism following the teachings, uh, in the spiritual practice of yoga in order to be released from the ignorance regarding the reality of the physical world and so gain nirvana. Buddhism following the teachings of the Buddha and so achieving a status of non-self, the denial of personality, whereby the realities of life and death, which are real, no longer cause personal suffering. Or Confucianism following the teachings of Confucius so that life here and now might be lived truly and well allowing the inevitability of death to darken one, not allowing the reality of death to darken one's, darken one's light in the present, or Platonism, classical Greek philosophy, following the teachings of the great philosophers, and so seeing the soul as the locus of human personality and the physical aspects of life as only the husks, not allowing the physical to impede the progress of the soul, and welcoming death as release from imprisonment, or naturalistic humanism accepting the humanist analysis of mankind's condition apart from God, and so making the most of this life while being conscious of the inevitability of death and working for the continuation of one's ideals in the human race generally, or even Judaism, while basing itself on God having chosen his people and on what God has done historically for his people, beginning with his action for them, focuses almost to the exclusion of all else on the teachings of Torah, the law of Moses, both written and oral, so being Torah-centered. Judaism tends to become, in many of his expressions, more path-oriented, God helping his people to fulfill his instructions and so to be acceptable before him. In 1 Corinthians, however, 1 Corinthians 15, however, Paul sets before us the focus of Christian proclamation, and that focus is the death and resurrection of Christ. The teachings, the example of Jesus being important, but not the focus of the gospel's proclamation. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, this is the gospel that I preach to you. Or again, in verses 1 and 2, this is the gospel that you received, on which you have taken your stand, by which you were saved. Or again, in verses 3 and following, this is the gospel that is traditional within the church. The verbs paradidomi, paralambano, being words for the passing on of tradition. The fourfold repetition of the hate, that, 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 introducing confessional material of some sort whether one confession of four parts or four separate confessions. The expression according to the scriptures of verses 3 and 4, 
appearing nowhere else in Paul's writings, though appearing twice here. The inclusion of the Aramaic name Cephas in verse 5, suggesting a Palestinian milieu. The term the twelve in verse 5, seeming to be a fixed way of referring to the disciples of Jesus, even after Judas's suicide, and seemingly strange on Paul's lips and in his letters. All of that suggesting that Paul is here quoting some kind of fixed confessional material that focuses upon the death and the resurrection. And finally, Paul saying in verse 11, quite unequivocally, whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach and this is what you believed. In fact, Paul says as he starts this out, this is the gospel that stresses in protois of first importance, not just referring in time, but to importance. First importance, that Christ died, that he was buried, that Christ was raised, that he appeared to Cephas and the Twelve. This is not something of some docetist doctrine, he only appeared so to do, but died and was buried. This is a doctrine that talks in terms of resurrection and appearance. It is a proclamation, quite frankly, and we fail to catch the uh, difference here because we're used to it, but that stands in opposition to what most have and what one would think God would do. Paul acknowledges this in 1 Corinthians 1.18 and following, for the proclamation of the cross is foolishness to the world, being a stumbling block or a scandal to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. Jews had other expectations of their Messiah, glory, national sovereignty, political power, even perhaps military conquest as you read Psalms of Solomon 17 and 18, or look at the Dead Sea material in the War Scroll. Other expectations that were not in terms of death, dying, etc. Greeks had quite other expectations regarding divine intervention, lofty teaching, the glory of Mount Olympus, irresistible power. Who would have thought that divine Redemption would focus on a cross. You've often heard the modern satirists, satirists say, quote, it's like today wearing a miniature electric chair or symbolic gallows around one's neck, which usually draws a laugh, but quite frankly points up the irony of it all. Indeed, who would have thought that we would focus and that the gospel would focus upon the cross? Paul said this as he writes to the Romans, the capital city of the empire, and begins that letter in 116 with, I am not ashamed of the gospel, and goes on to say, because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first the Jew, then also the Gentile. There is reason to be embarrassed if we judge the gospel only humanly. For it does not talk in terms, first of all, of lofty teaching, exaltation, the godly and the divine, as we would expect. It talks about suffering and death. And so, of course, Jesus in all of his ministry, uh, beginning at Caesarea, Philippi particularly, and on, talked about going to Jerusalem and suffering and dying and there entering into his glory. And that the path to glory was through suffering and death and resurrection. So I'd like to make the point that the resurrection of Christ is the basis for the Christian's hope. Christians at Corinth, having been only recently converted, were experiencing a number of problems in their lives, many of which seem to have been something of hangovers from their previous ways of looking at things. We're told of a number of problems they had in 1 Corinthians as we move closer to 1 Corinthians 15. You remember the divisions in chapters 1 to 4 that were learned by Paul through the house of Chloe 
the problems that had to do with immorality and incest in chapter 5, and in taking fellow believers before the law in chapter 6, which Paul says were commonly reported, and the problems that were addressed to him directly, they had written him about marriage and celibacy in chapter 7, eating meat offered previously offered to idols in 8 through 10, disorders in the church in the first part of chapter 11, disorders in the celebration of the Lord's Supper in the latter part of chapter 11, spiritual gifts in chapters 12 through 14. Uh, the particulars in regard to their problems in regard to resurrection are not spelled out for us as they are in those other matters of the first 14 chapters. Yet it seems clear from the way in which Paul deals with those issues that these problems were focused there in the Corinthian church and probably, if I may use the term, resulted from what could be called an over-realized eschatology. That is, a belief that everything concerning the hope of the gospel had been fulfilled in their present experience, union with Christ, exalted spiritual state, the full culmination of God's promises. And we can even go further, for from what could be called a mirror reading of 1 Corinthians 15, that is, reading his statements as polemics against erroneous views, and so trying to understand what they were saying by what he answers, mirror reading, if I can call it that, some of the Christ Corinthian Christians seem to have been asserting, as Paul says, that there was no resurrection of the dead. How can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? 1 Corinthians 15, 12. And particular from his argument seem to have been arguing three things. One, that the personal resurrection of a believer is irrelevant since the eschatological hope of the gospel is already fulfilled in our present spiritual experience. They weren't thinking in historical terms of what is sometimes called inaugurated eschatology. What has taken place and is taking place is only but the forerunner of what will take place yet to be. But they're thinking in rather existential, present, immediately personal terms. Greek thought tends to think more in static fashion, less in terms of ongoing history. And to this claim, Paul, of course, answers, as we'll turn later, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. But not only they seem to be saying is the resurrection, personal resurrection, irrelevant, it is also impossible. In Greek philosophy, the body was excluded from divine re redemption. Perhaps also they're saying impossible in reaction to certain crass and crude Jewish ideas of resurrection that I'd like to talk about in our third lecture down the pike. That is simply resuscitation, reanimation. To this claim of impossibility, Paul answers, but some will say, how are the dead raised? With what body will they come? 1 Corinthians 15, 35. And then go on to explain how foolish that question is and what analogies we can draw for understanding the answer to that question. But not only, it seems, at Corinth were they saying irrelevant and impossible, but also, it seems, we're saying that the personal resurrection of a believer is unnecessary since by creation we possess an immortal soul and now by redemption a redeemed soul, all of which makes any further action on God's part quite unnecessary. And to this claim of not being necessary, Paul answers, I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood, or man in his finitude, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. This mortal must be clothed with immortality. 1 Corinthians 15, 50, and again, 53. If you would note carefully, there are three particles in Greek 
and I appeal to some of the Acadian Divinity College students, uh, that pretty much set off the next three lectures that I would like to make. The one in verse 12 of chapter 15 is the particle hote, that, where he argues for the thatness or the relevance in opposition to the claim irrelevant. And then in chapter 15, verse 35, the particle pus or how, where he argues against, where he argues here for the manner of the believer's resurrection against the claim that it is impossible. And then in verse 53, the particle de, where he argues for the necessity uh, against those who say it is unnecessary. Paul's argument in 1 Corinthians 15, I would like to propose, is that the resurrection of Christ is the starting point and paradigm or pattern for all Christian thought about a believer's confrontation of death and a believer's life after death, as well as the basis for all thought about living life here and now in face of death. Throughout the New Testament, there is the proclamation of what Christ has done. And then I would like to suggest there is the development of that to understand what meaning that has for our lives. If I can give you an example, Jesus talked in terms of his discipleship in the Gospels, in terms of taking up his cross, suffering, death, and so vindication and glory, and that being the pattern. In Mark's Gospel, as you might know, in the great discussions on discipleship, the focus is more and more on Mark 8, 31 through 10, 52, where those three great passion predictions are brought together. And then in each case, there is a discussion of what that means for discipleship. If we can catch the understanding of what Messiahship meant for Jesus, we can then see what discipleship means for his own. And so in the last 10 years, Mark, 10, Mark 8, 31 to 10, 52 has been a focus of a great deal of study in the Markan Gospel and the Synoptic Gospels. Christ's redefinition of Messiahship in those passion predictions, and then as seen in the passion narrative itself, serve as the pattern or paradigm for all of our thinking about Christian discipleship. Likewise, Paul, as he talks about the future and what it will be like in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, begins by saying, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and then goes on to say, and I delivered, and I, by the word of the Lord I say this unto you, and then goes on to spell out what it means for the end. On the basis of what I would call a functional Christology, our confession that Jesus died and rose, we have certain implications in regard to the future. On the basis of what he has said by the word of the Lord, we have implications regarding the future. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 says, Behold, I tell you a mystery, something enigmatic, something now to be clarified. A mystery in the Greek world is something that is a secret, something that is esoteric. A mystery in the Jewish world, as Raymond Brown long ago pointed out in his doctoral dissertation on Musterion, is not something esoteric, but something that is enigmatic something that is known to some extent, but now is able to be known much better, always on the basis of revelation in some way. So in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there is the Raz, the Aramaic word for mystery, but there is the Pesher, the Aramaic word for interpretation that is given. You knew something, now you come to understand more, or in Qumran, Maybe you misunderstood, but now you come to understand. But nonetheless, always that clarification of the enigma. So Paul says in 1 Corinthians, I want to clarify that that is enigmatic. 
I would like in days, nights to come rather, <laughs> to talk in terms of enigma and how the resurrection of Christ clarifies the enigma and gives us guidance for understanding of the nature of death and life behind. It is that mystery, enigma now clarified, Paul says, that I want to speak further about to you as he goes on in 1 Corinthians. Basic to the mystery is the fact of the resurrection of Christ himself and the proclamation of Christ's resurrection by the church. It is only because of Christ's resurrection and the church's proclamation of God having raised Christ from the dead that we have hope in regard to the face, in the face of death an expectation for life beyond death. Our hope as Christians, I would just really leave with you tonight, is not in denying death, not in renouncing personhood, not even in holding on to the soul's immortality, though of that we must speak further, not struggling to rise higher in the cycles of reincarnation, not even being brave in the face of the inevitable. For many godly Christians have died without that feigned bravery. Our hope rather stems from God, Christ's own resurrection, where death has been conquered and life beyond death has been opened. And what I would like to suggest as we meet next evening is, and take as my title, Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Our hope is not in something that we can teach ourselves to believe, is not in something we can hold on to, is not in some attitudes that we can pump up. Our hope is ultimately in God who raised Christ from the dead and thus set the paradigm for our own victory over death. I thank you.